Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Robotic Process Automation 101. What is it and what can it mean for your organization? I'm Teresa Resick, the Director of Webinars here at AIM, and AIM is your host and producer of today's event. And with me today are Chris Serdak from Serdak & Co. and Stu Leibowitz from IBM. And IBM is the sponsor of today's webinar, and we thank them for their support. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. And before we get started, just want to offer a few pointers for viewing today's webinar. By joining our webinars live, you can customize your own viewing experience, so feel free to open, close, or resize the different windows. Across the bottom of your screen is a list of all the widgets available to you. And in one of those widgets is group chat. And just open that by clicking on the group chat icon. And um, with that, you'll be able to text chat with each other and also with a few of us from here at AIM. Do ask questions of the speakers throughout the hour using the Q&A feature, and that's to the left of the slide area. And we will hold these questions until the end where we should have five or 10 minutes to answer them. But you can also use this feature to ask for technical assistance. You can download a PDF of the presentation at any time. Just look to the resources list, and that's to the right of the slide area. And there's also a few other documents and links in there to help you learn more about today's topic. So again, if you would just click in there at any time, those resources will open in a new browser tab, and you can save them and, and read them after the webinar. And at the end of the webinar, a brief survey will open in your browser, and we'd appreciate it if you take a few moments to offer your feedback and to suggest other topics for us to cover. And this webinar is being recorded, and it will be available um, in the next few days to AIM.org's Resources Webinars page. And uh, right now I just want to introduce the panel of speakers that we have with us today. And uh, Chris Serdak is an award-winning author, innovator, disruptor, engineer, and strategist. He's an industry-recognized expert on mobility, analytics, big data, information security, regulatory compliance, and cloud computing with, only t with over 20 years of professional experience. And Chris is also the Program Director for Intelligent Automation at the Institute of Robotic Process Automation. And we also have with us Stu Leibowitz, who is a product manager at IBM. And Stu has broad experience helping customers embrace enterprise software across multiple industries and geographies. He's a very versatile technical resource, and he is known for his ability to traverse both the business and deep technical aspects of the projects he works with. So right now, I'm going to turn things over to Chris Serdak to begin discussing just what is RPA. Chris? Thanks, Teresa, and good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, happy to have you here and hopefully do a little bit of enlightening about this RPA uh, topic, which is probably one of the fastest growing tech topics I've, I've seen in my career. Uh, those of you that did big data or Hadoop in the, in the past four or five years, uh, you may have uh, joined my thought that, that that came on really quickly, but RPA has absolutely exploded in the last 12 months. So hopefully we can clear up some of the questions about it and also share some of the uh, best lessons learned in the course of the last two years or so as, as I've uh, worked with many companies trying to figure out how this technology can help their business and what are the ins and outs of putting it to good use. Um, what's very interesting also is, is that robotics uh, or RPA, this, this process automation using software robots, is part of a continuum around artificial intelligence. Um, another topic that's getting tremendous amounts of hype, as you can see from the slide here, the amount of money that's being invested at the low end in robotics and at the high end in machine learning and artificial intelligence has absolutely exploded over the course of the last four or five years and is expected to grow dramatically in the coming decade. So uh, as all these new technologies go through a certain hype cycle, uh, you can expect to hear even more talk about this technology, both robotics and artificial intelligence, but we're also seeing significant progress being made. Uh, and so expect that there will be more of this entering in your, your work life in the coming years um, as, as, again, more companies begin to embrace the technology and do more with it. The, the impact that this technology will likely have on the workforce, and, and let's be very, uh, let, let's deal with the elephant in the room, so to speak. This, uh, the use of robots is going to supplement and in many cases replace human workers. The technology has been doing that for, in humanity for millennia, so that's nothing new, but it is going to impact a new class of workers. 
Um, much like robots, physical robots replaced workers in factories over the course of the last 60 years, many data entry and what would traditionally be called white collar or knowledge worker jobs uh, may be replaced by software robots and artificial intelligence in the coming decade. The, the bad news is that that means there's a new class of people that are going to potentially see uh, their jobs be replaced. The good news is, is that the part of their job that's being replaced is the part that none of us particularly care for. It's data entry. It's repetitive tasks. It's the rote work that each of us may be required to do in our daily jobs that isn't terribly value-added but may be terribly important for the operations of your business. The more repetitive, the more rote, and frankly, the less interesting the work is, the more likely it is uh, that a robot will do it better than you. And that will allow workers in these roles to focus more of their attention on higher value-added tasks and, and cognitive tasks as opposed to the repetitive keystroke sort of work that many people do. But there is no question that there will be an impact on the workforce. And again, it's going to impact a segment of the workforce that may not have uh, faced this sort of supplement or replacement in the past. The one exception there is, is in processes that companies have traditionally outsourced in the last 30 years. One of the places we're seeing uh, tremendous uptake, early uptake in robotics is with business process outsourcers, uh, companies that have taken um, their clients' work offshore to do labor arbitrage. And in fact, RPA in many is best thought of not as a technology implementation, it is the adoption of a new workforce. So much like companies uh, went to uh, offshore uh, uh, workforces such as in India or Manila or, or Eastern Europe over the last 10 years, now, you're, now instead of offshoring with RPA, you are kind of unshoring. <laughs> you're going to a workforce that lives in the machine, works 24-7, doesn't complain, and doesn't take breaks to uh, shop on Amazon or check out their Instagram account. So we are absolutely in, uh, expecting an impact on the workforce, um, but it's not, not necessarily all bad. That being said, there are people that are concerned that this is the, the end of, or the start of the beginning or the beginning of the end, depending upon how you look at it. There's talk about the singularity and, and artificial intelligence taking over. Um, you can go to extremes with that concern, and, and people such as Elon Musk have talked about the, the existential threats of artificial intelligence. There may be some, some substance to that, but frankly, as someone who's worked in data sciences, analytics, and, and to an extent artificial intelligence for most of my career, we're still a long way away from having robot masters tell us what to do. Um, those, that possibility is out there, but with any luck, we will stay in front of the activities of these technologies long before they do that. Um, so the, the, uh, warnings of some people that catastrophe is nigh. Um, you know, don't get over wrapped up in that too much. We still have a long way to go before the technology becomes that intelligent. Uh, and robots are nothing new. Um, interestingly, if, if you kind of kept tra everyone talks about drones in the military now, and drones were a radical technology in the late 1990s. In fact, the the United States military actively rejected the use of drones and and absolutely would never contemplate arming them. That was something that was considered morally repugnant. Um, but drones very quickly took on these the, what the military calls the dirty, dull, and dangerous roles. These are things that humans don't necessarily want to do, they're not good at, or it's unnecessarily hazardous for humans. And drones were ideal for those sorts of tasks. Uh, low, it, it, so much so that once the, the military got over its initial fears of the unknown and, and could we use these things effectively, now they can't get their hands on enough of them. Um, interestingly enough, even, even local police forces in the United States are now buying drones and, and deploying them for use. Um, so yes, Big Brother is watching you. He's probably watching you with a drone and arguably you're safer because of it. But, but the use of robots or robotics in our civilization is not new. Um, in the corporate world, instead of dirty, dull, and dangerous, although there are still applications for physical robots to do that, what we're focusing on with software robots is repetitive, redundant, and risky. That is, what is something that a person has to do over and over and over again, very repetitive, hence boring, and, and subject to a lot of human error. 
Um, is it redundant? Do we, do we check something, check it again, and then check it a third time? And one of the interesting things that we talk about as I talk with legislators and regulators on, on how do we regulate these software robots, there's an open question in, in these knowledge worker jobs of is the, should the robot be the maker, the person that's entering the data, or should the robot be the checker? And right now, a lot of the checker functions of auditors and accountants and so forth, you need to be a licensed person. But we're having an open question of can I license a robot so that a robot can be the checker as opposed to the maker? Because frankly, if, if you have a checker, you're, you have someone that's trying to make sure the work was performed correctly, follows the necessary rules, is, is complete in every expected way, and frankly, that's what robots are really good at. So while many people are looking to replace the maker tasks in, in knowledge worker roles, um, very quickly th there's a compelling argument that the robot should actually be used in the checker role much more so than the maker role. Um, and then risky. Uh, what better way to prevent fraud than to use a robot to look for fraud? And, and actually, again, having the robot be the checker as opposed to the maker ensure that the rules are being followed. It's a much more rigorous test. And, and in fact, many companies that have uh, applied software robots find that it's a good solution for compliance concerns or risk management. So what is, what is RPA? Um, when I first heard the term robots, I'm thinking we're, we're going into banks and there's a little physical robot like you see in a manufacturing facility. It's not that at all. It, it's a software uh, program that sits on one or more computers and mimics human activities on those computers. Um, the, the clicks that you do, when you navigate from one screen to another, um, uh, the, the software can actually watch as you do that and learn to mimic or learn to even uh, improve upon those tasks as a person goes through them. So if you think of uh, macros, if you've ever written macros in a Microsoft product like Excel, uh, that's where the, the Excel software would actually watch you as you go through a numerous set of steps. You record that, and you can repeat that over and over again. That's very much what these robots are doing. Um, and so to train a robot, you literally have it sit there and watch humans do this task over and over again. And after a certain number of repetitions, the robot can take over and perform the same task as the human did uh, tirelessly at 10 or 20 times the speed and without interruption. Uh, so that's part of the benefit of using the robots. So it supports or supplants human employees in the processing, manipulation, triggering, or communication of data. Um, if you've ever had to, to log into two different systems and literally key in or copy-paste data from one system to another, that's an ideal application for robotics. And ironically, in 2017, there are still a zillion companies out there where there are large numbers of employees that are literally copy-pasting data from one system to another because integrating large-scale enterprise systems is necessarily expensive, complicated, and difficult to do correctly. So this is a way of achieving a degree of systems integration without actually integrating the systems. Um, and again, we're looking for high volume, highly repetitive, um, transactional, and where time, time is kind of sensitive. Many of these uh, manual processes take far too long to complete, particularly in a, in a day when my app uh, gives me instant gratification on my smartphone. And so robots are a way of, of dramatically reducing the cycle time in our processes, particularly where there's manual steps in between automated steps. And that's another sp place where we're seeing a lot of uptick in robotics. How do you use it? As I just mentioned, uh, highly repetitive uh, uh, process steps where we're trying to keep systems synchronized, but we don't have them integrated on the back end, so they're not doing data feeds automatically. So the synchronization steps make sure that all systems have the latest and greatest data, and, and you can actually change the speed with which you do that synchronization. Supervisory, again, making sure that people are entering data correctly or, or systems are, are being updated correctly. Uh, again, a robot can do that much more effectively, much more accurately, and, and more error-free. And then multi-platform. Um, despite decades of trying to integrate systems, and I know AIM is very religious about the need to federate systems and so forth, this is sort of a way of cheating on federation and an achieving degree of, of uh, synchronization between systems without necessarily spending a zillion dollars trying to integrate them on the back end, which if you've done that in the past, it's not a fun task to go through. 
some of the challenges, however, so so it's interesting if you if if you're a company that's more than about 20 years old, you are what I call analog. I mean, you were born analog. You you are business processes are based probably on old paper-based processes that have been automated through the 80s and 90s and so forth. And so if you still have manual steps in your company, someone somewhere has probably tried to automate that step dozens of times, and yet it's still manual. So why is this? These manual steps that exist in older companies still today are sort of the super bugs of, of the digital world. Um, you can't kill them off like superbugs in a hospital. They persist. And, and so why do these manual steps persist? One of the three Cs, either cost, complexity, or compliance. It's either too costly to integrate those systems and automate that step. It's too complex to get those systems synchronized. Or compliance says that I can't do it. And in any of these, so, so rather than assuming that if a company has manual steps today, they're somehow backwards or in the Stone Age, in all likelihood, they've taken many attempts in the past to automate that process step, and one or more of these three Cs got in the way. Um, so what's different now with robotics? Now, instead of integrating on the back end, RPA lets you integrate on the front end. And in fact, you're leveraging functionality that you've already designed because you already have people doing this work. Rather than trying to integrate databases in the back end of these enterprise systems, you've already set it up so that people can access the systems. You simply have a robot access as if it were a person. And that's, that's the real game changer in RPA. I don't actually have to do a lot of engineering of my systems. I simply need to adopt a new workforce that happens to be digital. Uh, despite all of that, RPA, the huge hype that hit last year is, has tailored off a little bit. It's still pretty hyped, um, and judging by the number of people on the call today, there's still a lot of interest in it. But we are a little bit in the trough of disillusionment. Many people piloted uh, RPA in the last 18 months or so. Most pilots went s swimmingly well because, frankly, the technology works quite well, um, and there's not a ton of technical complexity to doing this. But the challenges that companies have faced, in, in my experience, is scaling up and scaling out. You, you, you showed me that one robot can do the work of four people. Now I want to have 1,000 robots do the work of 4,000 people. And how do we do that? And that's generally where companies have, have come into a lot of challenge in leveraging RPA. Um, there have been some technical challenges with some of the technologies. They don't necessarily scale that well, although the companies that develop the technologies are working very hard to, to get that problem solved, and there has been a lot of progress there. But the challenges are more often organizational and operational. And by that I mean, um, for instance, when you have a, an RPA robot that's going to take over a role, you need to give it access to the systems it's going to operate in, just like you would give a person access. Well, many systems, op, uh, processes in our company say, if I'm going to give you access to a system, I need your employee ID, or I need your social security number, or I need some other personal identifying information. Well, how do you get a social security number to a robot? Who assigns it, how do you control it, and how do you ensure it's unique, and so on. It's those sorts of issues, more associated with the workforce than necessarily the technology, that tend to, they weren't thought through necessarily during pilot phase, and these are the things that many people get stuck on. Um, your, business, your, your business case to do so may have said, okay, we're going to get rid of 10 people uh, by implementing robots. Well, did anyone let HR know that you're planning on getting rid of 10 people? Uh, what was your plan for either terminating them, repurposing them, reassigning them, and, and making sure that that plan was in place and ready to execute as, as you went beyond pilot and went into production? These are things that um, for the last couple of years as people tried the technology, they didn't necessarily think all of that through. Um, another great example is password resets. company had a policy to reset your password every 30 days. A robot doesn't know how to reset its password. Uh, the robot can't use its uh, child's birth date as its password because it doesn't have a child. So you had to think through these sorts of factors, and these were the challenges that, that um, hindered scaling up and scaling out uh, many of these pilots early on. But now organizations are kind of getting past that, and they're seeing what the best practices are. So we're getting through that trough of disillusionment, and I think we're going to see a lot more very successful implementations in the near future. Uh, traditional automation versus RPA. This is absolutely key, and if I can give you one key takeaway from today's session, it's this. 
traditional automation or business process reengineering is where you'd sit down, you'd map out every single process, every exception, every nuance, every rule, and then a year and a half from now, maybe you'd try to come up with some kind of automation for that process. That's the way we've done it for half a century. It seems to work. It's not very effective, but we, that's how we've done it. Um, RPA does not have to be like that, nor should it. With RPA, you can take a process that's been optimized and, and improved for years and instantaneously take a manual process step in that process and improve its performance by a factor of 10 or 20 or even 98%. That, that's not, I've actually seen processes where there's a 98% improvement in process cycle time. Um, so you can achieve tremendous results without actually changing anything, without, in, without re-engineering anything. It's just switching to a different workforce. Then, after you've achieved that new automation results, you should re-engineer at that point because now you have a whole new idea and a whole new perspective of what the process performance could be. And so rather than trying to re-engineer and optimize before you apply th this automation, you should automate first, see what you get, because you're going to have breakthrough improvements in your process performance without making any other changes, and then re-engineer. This allows you to generate results to the business in weeks, not years. It, it allows you to have significant performance improvement, again, in weeks, and then it makes your subsequent re-engineering efforts much more effective. So um, we're kind of recommending you do the exact opposite of the way we've done it for decades, automate first and then do some re-engineering afterwards. Some of the types of RPA out there, you might have heard of Mimic Bots. That's uh, software that literally just does whatever a human, human does. And when it sees something that it's not, never been shown before, it literally just stops. It acts like a human. It's good for repetitive tasks. Smart Bots, we, we say that they think that's a bit of a stretch. They're, they're not necessarily cognitive, but they can adapt a little bit once you've given them a range of choices they can make. They can't make choices you haven't defined for them, but they can make choices among the options that you've given them. And then IQ bots, we're not quite there yet, but we're trying to get there. And that's where uh, the bot actually comes up against an unknown, unexpected, unanticipated, and untrained event, and it tries to make a best guess. That's where we're going, and that's kind of the creepy Skynet uh, hail taking over sort of technology, but we have a long way to go before we get there. But these are some of the wording that, and types out there that you hear of. Um, we're very, very heavy in mimic bots, and smart bots are starting to uh, get out there into production use, but it's still very early for a lot of that. Four things as, as other takeaways. There's four areas that I focus on with this sort of project. There's, um, there's technical challenges, which is on the prior slide. There's operational challenges. Um, did I, do I know how I'm going to repurpose people? Did I think about uh, what I'm going to do when this process works twice as fast as it used to and so on? Um, then there's governance challenges. How do I manage the outputs of the, of the robot? If I have to make a change to the process, how do I cascade that to the robot's instructional set? Um, is compliance okay with what the, what the robot does? Um, a lot of people don't ask those questions early on, and that's another thing that's, that stops or slows down the, the scale up and scale out after a successful pilot. And then finally, sponsorship. Uh, and I can't emphasize this enough. Uh, I literally have a situation in a large company where someone that managed 10,000 people that did data entry, we were going to replace 9,000 of those people with robots. And you think that would be a great thing, but this is a person that spent their entire career trying to get to the point where they had 10,000 people reporting to them. They weren't real excited about losing 90% 90, 90 of their workforce that they managed because that was how they identified their success and their power in their organization. So making sure you have the right sponsorship at the right level is key. Um, the way you figure this is you want the, the sponsor should be someone with a vested interest in the result, not a vested interest in the process. Someone with a vested interest in the process is not really going to embrace robotics. Someone with a vested interest in the result is going to love this stuff. So be careful who you get to sponsor it. Uh, and so what? Before I hand off, another key thing here is if, if you are looking at a business process and your company is, again, more than 20 years old, you have worked tirelessly to optimize and improve that process. Getting more ROI out of that process is potentially very challenging, although we have seen these huge improvements in cycle time. 
So making the business case isn't always a good one from an ROI perspective, but you have to look at other returns, and, and it's returns that we haven't focused on, particularly return on time. What's the value of getting a transaction done more quickly? And if you've, if you've filled out an online application on an app on your smartphone in the last year, you're probably annoyed if you have to enter your own data. Now, privacy aside, that's the value of doing things more quickly in today's age. Because if I had to fill out that form myself, I'm probably going to go with someone else. So return on time is absolutely key, and robots are great for it. Return on quality, what's the value of having things pass through your process one time, first time, without changes and corrections? Back to speed and accuracy. So return on quality, what's the value of making sure that your stuff actually performs correctly? And then return on attention, it, you're, you're not going to get rid of all of your, your human workers, but your human workers, when they're no longer doing transactional stuff, can focus their attention on actual customer service, on solving problems, and focusing on exceptions. Uh, in my writing, I talk about how we've, been, we've worked so tirelessly in improving our business processes that customers no, no longer value perfection. They simply expect it. And now our definition of quality is based upon what do you do when something goes wrong, not, not the fact that you deliver things effectively. So repurpose, the value of repurposing your workforce to manage exceptions as they occur and deliver good customer service when something goes wrong is the new definition of quality in our world, and robotics allow you to repurpose your workforce to that end. Uh, that is my section. Stu, I'm happy to hand it over to you. Well, thanks so much, Chris. Again, my name is Stu Leibowitz. I'm a product manager at IBM, and essentially I own the product marketing for our RPA offering. And it's certainly an exciting time at IBM for RPA. So many of our customers are either started already on their RPA journey or they're planning and, and discussing their RPA journeys. And so what I want to do today is just introduce you to our partnership with Automation Anywhere, and our offering comes by way of this partnership. Now, Automation Anywhere, they're one of the largest providers of RPA solutions. They were rated as the leader for RPA in the last Forrester report, for example. And the reason why we partner with them is that our approaches are just so similar. So in terms of the solutions that we provide for our customers, they're both business-friendly and IT-friendly at the same time. So they're, they're business-friendly solutions, but, but at the same time, we've tackled some of the issues that Chris alluded to around security, around scalability, governance, and auditability. Um, and also, our, our companies just enjoy a strong go-to-market presence and, and deployment ecosystem. So we have lots of common business partners, lots of systems integrators that can help you to be successful. And so what I want to do, and, and this is really the slide, uh, if there's one slide for you to remember, um, I just want to introduce you to something that we at IBM are referring to as digital labor. Um, and, and that's really the ability to enhance RPA with other automation capabilities in order to provide even more value in your solutions. And so if you look at the graphic, if you, if you look at this fellow, he, he has his hands on his keyboard. Um, the keyboard uh, or the hands is what's representing the software, the software robots, and, and that's what's mimicking the repetitive application task interfaces as, as Chris described. And it's, it's RPA, that's really the core capability of digital labor. But let's look how other aspects of the human will, will be able to enhance that. And so the eyes represent data capture. There's lots of information on the screen, but there's also paper and, and other information that has to become part of the automation. And so we can enhance the digital labor by automating the understanding of unstructured data like documents, uh, like invoices or claims. And, and this will enable RPA to process even more data. Also, let's look at the left brain and the right brain. So the left brain, that they perform tasks that have to do with logic. And so here it would represent the rule-based business decisions. So again, we can enhance digital labor by enabling more complex activities to be automated. And the right brain, well, that's more intuitive, more thoughtful, more subjective. And so by uh, using technologies like Watson, we can enhance digital labor by understanding unstructured voice, images, and textual data automatically. And so we can use cognitive capabilities, again, to transform the unstructured data into information that will enable RPA to cover more scenarios. 
And then finally, just as the central nervous system controls the activities of the body, that here represents coordination and orchestration. So we can enhance digital labor by coordinating the hands, the eyes, and both aspects of the brain together to maximize the ability of what digital labor can achieve. And so because I'm coming to you from IBM, uh, I'll uh, also mention the different products that that corresponds to and, and how they work together. So again, digital labor is providing the automation of these repetitive uh, tasks, um, and it's enhanced with the other aspects. So we liken the coordination and orchestration to uh, business process management, because automating repetitive tasks in a process, that might be only one part of the solution. If it's an end-to-end -end process, like account opening, um, there's usually people, decisions, uh, and, and, and uh, robots that you're orchestrating into one uh, solution. And that's really the reason why we actually bundle DTM into our core RPA solution. For the decisions or the left brain, RPA bots are great at mimicking interactions with the simple rules, but they're not always optimized for handling complex decisions. And so we can make robots smarter by adding these business rule-based decisions using tools like IBM's Operational Decision Manager. And for the capture, RPA bots really only process the structured information. With so much unstructured information, um, we can you know, provide cognitive extraction of the unstructured documents and images so that uh, robots can act on more and more scenarios. And we combine that with something we call IBM Data Cap. And then finally, for the cognitive, I'm sure you've all heard of Watson. There's so much unstructured data from feeds like web chats, voice calls, emails, uh, social data feeds, and our RPA just can't process that alone. And so cognitive computing along with the robots can dramatically transform the automation by adding uh, that intelligence. And so here, mo moving on, just again, some more detail on these combinations. Again, the first combination combines RPA robots with orchestration and its uh, ability to orchestrate the digital labor with your knowledge workers. And so now you can handle the task, no matter whether they're handled by automated bots or people or systems. Um, this can also simplify some of the RPA exception processing, especially when you need a human, say, to resolve an exception. The second combination is how you can make bots, bots smarter and more agile. It enables bots to leverage the skills of experts uh, for tasks like risk, insurance claims, compliance, complex pricing. And so the obvious benefit here is that you're not kind of polluting the bot logic with, with all these business decisions, but rather managing them in a purposeful tool outside of the bot authoring. Um, and then finally, uh, the third combination, that leverages OCR capabilities and cognitive capabilities so that you can include unstructured documents and they can be consumed by the bots to make them more productive. And so um, because of the audience, I, I chose to go a little, just a little bit deeper into um, the data cap example. And so again, the, the, the point here is that you can use a tool like data cap to train uh, your applications to process unstructured data. So if you're getting things like invoices in from various sources and they're all slightly different, um, data cap is really good at, at, at that training process and then ultimately what, what DataCap is doing is converting the unstructured data into structured data. And then that structured data is just so much more useful and able to be used by the bots. And so, uh, you know, a simple uh, example of this might be, uh, you know, some correspondence, right? Our, our customer service people these days are swamped with inbound emails, um, but, but again, it is structured. Uh, and, and you need a way to understand what is the contents of that. And so that's something that DataCap is really good at um, analyzing, at categorizing, extracting, and then delivering that information uh, to the bots. Um, once it is structured data, um, then it's very easy to program the bot to act on that, uh, be it in this case, um, take the customer complaint, maybe within some constraints, it's automatically issuing your credit or it's automatically responding uh, with an email 
or it's um, you know noting the information or you know updating a backend database. Those are all tasks that are very well suited for RPA. Just a couple of quick um, examples. Some of our customers that we're working with. Um, ANZ Bank is a client, and they apply automation, you know, across really a lot of areas in their institutional and retail banking businesses. Um, they do processes like transaction investigations, tracing funds, recalling funds, uh, funds disbursement. Um, and so their team has been able to decrease the level of human, human involvement significantly um, and also just uh, decreasing the time to execute these processes. Um, so by improving the quality of work, um, there's increased speed and there's obviously greater accuracy, and, and that accuracy is leading to customer satisfaction. Uh, they were able to deploy about 100 robots in, in their first six months. Um, they have significant cost savings. Often it's 40 percent uh, more, and there's, again, substantial reduction um, in the end, end time to deliver uh, uh, the, the results for their customers. Um, and they started by focusing on you know, automating very, very simple things, so not swinging for the fences. Um, and they're finding that the ROI payback is much faster, and it's you know really helping them to accel accelerate their digital transformation. And the next example is at Boston Scientific. Um, uh, they're using it for some of these uh, processes that you see here, um, you know, for pre-registration form. Um, and a, a bot can monitor an email inbox, and there's a PDF. Uh, attached to the form, and the bot can automatically enter that information into the billing tools and notify the inventory team that it has a request. Um, there's also uh, transmission summaries where bots are monitoring, simply just monitoring network folders. When the summary is downloaded, uh, Automation Anywhere can upload the information into the billing tool without human inter intervention. Also for invoice preparation, the bot can download a data file and enter that information into the SAT system um, or database uh, to produce the invoice, again, without any um, human interaction. So they're able to dramatically reduce the development cost over uh, doing that with traditional software approaches. Um, and, and especially for that invoice preparation example, the errors were reduced to near zero. And so again, the, the results that we see or the benefits that we see for our customers with RPA, um, it's around accelerated time to value. Um, as you uh, dig deeper into the tooling that we provide, you can, you'll see that the time to create, test, deliver these automation, it's measured in days or weeks. These projects aren't you know, months or years. Um, there's a, a, a vast reduction in the human errors um, because you know, we can reduce the human errors associated with things like copy and paste or manually entering the data. Um, there's in increased throughput, obviously. Um, bots run faster than humans. They don't take breaks. They don't take vacation days if, if you don't want them to, they, so they can you know, run around the clock. Um, and finally, there's decreased development costs. Again, as you look at the tooling, we provide intuitive designer environments that can you know, model automation visually without code. We have powerful recorders that can build automations by watching someone work and, and, and then using a rich library of activities to, to drag and drop to you know, enhance and complete the automations. So uh, I hope you've learned a little bit more about our offering. Um, here's our landing page. It's ibmbiz slash robotic dash process dash automation. Uh, we do offer uh, a free uh, trial so you can download and, and try it out yourself. Um, we also have you know, some free initial consulting. We can come, uh, for example, and do uh, a small discovery workshop to help understand what your business objectives are and how we can align them with uh, various um, tasks that might be prime for your initial automation projects. Um, so thanks very much for listening. I'm going to turn it back over to Teresa now for the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. We've been listening um, to Stu Leibowitz from IBM, and before that we were listening to Chris Serdak. And I can tell you, I, I was personally thoroughly engrossed in hearing all of the, everything that you were sharing because this is such a fascinating topic. Um, but I do want to get to the questions that we have here, and I'll do my best to get to um, as many of these questions as we can. Uh, there's certainly more questions than, than I know we can get to in the remaining time that we have. So. Um, uh, one of the, the questions someone's asking, and um, 
Chris, I'll start with you, but Stu, feel free to, to chime in on this um, because someone's asking about what skills are needed to add this type of product, um, to add robotics into their, their organization. Um, so you need someone that has a fair amount of experience in, in software scripting. Um, the tools themselves are, are very object-oriented and how they're structured and so forth. And, and you can get, if you have someone in your organization that has a, even a rudimentary amount of coding uh, experience, they can probably make themselves uh, sufficiently dangerous to get through a pilot. And so there's a lot of emphasis out there, well, we have to get trained, we've got to get the right skill set, we need software engineers. You need someone that, that, again, understands how to do the installation and so forth, and, and those skills are out there fairly readily. The more important part of this is getting people that can understand business process, understand how the business operates, um, why people do what they do in, when they're performing the tasks and so forth. So w what's interesting here is that um, IT is traditionally the, the people that build these sorts of solutions, and this is an instance where the business itself can and likely should lead the project. So you're going to need someone that has at least some amount of, of understanding of software development, but the, the tools are actually quite a bit simpler to implement than most um, larger scale enterprise solutions. And um, you, you also want someone that's cognizant of security threats. So interestingly, ro the use of robots um, in some ways greatly reduces cyber threats. Um, if you have one robot uh, entering data instead of 100 people, it's, it's much more secure. However, if, if a hacker gets through that one robot, then they have the keys to the kingdom. So th there is less risk but greater, um, uh, greater a greater issue if there is a problem. So you want to have someone with a, a security background also engaged in some way. Uh, Stu, I don't know how you'd like to address that or uh, answer the question. Oh, no, I think that's a, uh, a great way of, of saying it. You know, it, it is a collaboration between the, the business folks and, and the IT. It, you know, it's a, it's a great alternative to traditional uh, development approaches. So it's certainly the skill set on the technical side is not nearly as deep you know, as, as trying to work with APIs against something like um, like um, SAP. So, you know, the, the folks that are good at scripting um, uh, come to mind. But again, uh, really the strong suit is that the project needs to be set up with a strong collaboration between um, the business issues and the, um, and the IT folks. Okay. Um, Stu, someone is asking a question specific to um, IBM's RPA product. Does it run in the cloud? Yeah, that's a great question. So while most of our customers uh, seem to be embracing this with a uh, traditional on-premise approach where they install the, uh, the software in their own data center, um, we do offer um, environments where they could set that up and run it in the cloud. Okay. Um, and someone's asking um, for the next question, and uh, Chris, I'll bounce this over to you to, to start with. Um, Someone's asking about how things like, um, I know Stuart directly addressed OCR, but, but other um, activities like classification. Um, how friendly is this to incorporate it in with the bots? You know, things like classification and OCR. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to be a little bit controversial on this one, but most of the vendors, if not all of the vendors that are producing RPA software have um, embedded OCR technology. By the same token, there are companies out there that focus specifically on OCR, and frankly, most of the ones that are focused on OCR are really good at it because it's all that they do. And so many of the companies, clients that I've worked with that are trying to implement RPA use the embedded OCR technologies that the RPA providers uh, provide, and they're not nearly as functionally rich or as versatile as the dedicated platforms. <clears throat> so... Um, if you have rudimentary OCR needs, this is in terms of you know scanning in the document and understanding what it says. If, if your needs aren't really complicated, then the embedded technologies that come with the RPA software is probably good enough. But if you have um, uh, a, a lot of needs for scanning and recognizing you know, handwriting and so forth, you're probably better off using a dedicated OCR product that integrates back to the RPA. Um, that's just my, my kind of personal take on it. And it's interesting, I, I presented at an OCR conference a couple of months ago 
Um, and in prior years, I told him, you know, I think your business is, is you know, going the way of the, the dodo bird and you should probably move into a different industry. And now that RPA is on scene, it kind of, it's kind of reviving all these legacy platforms, legacy systems in a way that the OCR business is probably going to be booming in the next few years. So um, they, they all, all the systems will integrate with your existing OCR or with other OCR technologies. And unless your your needs in scanning are pretty basic, you're probably better off going with a third party tool for those sorts of needs. Okay. Um, so yeah, I and I can add. Uh, oh, go ahead. And, and I can just add that that's kind of the approach that we've taken at, at IBM. Uh, there is some uh, basic uh, capabilities within the core Automation Anywhere product. Um, uh, um, IBM has a DataCat product, which is a separate offering, but that, um, you know, as Chris said, it's separate to the RPA, but very complementary, and that's what we recommend when the customer has um, industrial strength needs for, for OCR and, and other cognitive capabilities around uh, what we call document ingestion. And, and we didn't answer the other part of the question, which is like char character recognition or whatever. That's why you'd go with a third-party OCR because their tools are likely heavily focused on on that recognition and capture, and that's you know so that's the bread and butter. They'll probably be better at it. So it's better to use that capability embedded in a in a third-party product and just integrate the results back into what the robots are doing. Okay. Um, uh, Stu, I want you to lead off with the, this next question. Someone's asking about, um, like, how large of an organization would benefit benefit from this? So, you know, company size, the types of industries. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing with your customer base on who's benefiting most from implementing RPA sooner than later? Well, it's. It's interesting because from the uh, from the industry or the vertical perspective, I, I'm seeing similar things to what we find in our our, our business process management and, and decision management offerings, um, and, and that's really any um, any of the uh, businesses can benefit because it it's really not as much about the uh, specific application, but just more our ability to remove these mundane tasks um, because uh, all all organizations have. Um, a lot of paper, and there's a, um, there's a lot of cutting and pasting or, or swivel chair um, integrations that are, are just very, very su well suited for the technology. Um, and, and so because, and because this technology is, you know, relatively inexpensive to get started with, um, I think it, it, we, we see, you know, a, a lot of uptake, you know, especially with uh, smaller um, companies, even, you know, even as far as uh, in, in other geographies, not just in North America. Um, so it is something I think that scales well across the verticals and, and as well, you know, is being used by uh, some of my largest customers, but also uh, lots of our small customers. I, my only caveat would be the, the larger the organization is and the larger the potential impact to the workforce, the harder it is to implement. And, and that's not from a technical perspective. It's from a holy cow, are we prepared to let go of 500 people or 1,000 people or whatever? Um, any organization of any scale can benefit from this. The more you have points in your business processes where, may, where, where physical documents or analog data needs to be digitized so the rest of your processes can work, the more you have that going on, the more robots can help. And the more you'll have these significant improvements in processing speed and capacity, and literally I've seen 98% reductions in cycle times for certain steps by going with robots. So it, it, larger companies will be more challenged because there's potentially more of an impact to your overall workforce, which means you have to sit with compliance and HR and so forth. Um, but it's more how, how much analog physical documents and data need to be ingested into your process for it to execute effectively. And that's, that's where robots can have an impact. Okay. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of things here that AIM has going on. And uh, in our market intelligence department, they are conducting some new research. And since RPA is one of the newest trends to hit our industry, um, they're just looking to get feedback from you. So as we roll out more and more content on the topic, I'd love it if you would take a few minutes to share your thoughts on RPA in the survey that we have. 
And there's a link to the survey in the resources list. You can also, when you download a copy of the slides, you can get the address here. And, and you just greatly value your taking the time to come in and participate in this, sur this survey. Um, but you can also opt in to receive early results from this. Um, and by doing that, you'll also be eligible to win an Apple Watch. They're uh, doing a nice little giveaway for this. So um, greatly value your feedback here in uh, specific to RPA as well. And join us in San Antonio, Texas um, for the Ames Annual Conference coming up in April 2018. Uh, we have exciting keynote speakers that are getting lined up right now with, along with a lot of great educational sessions and roundtable discussions. So for more information, go to aimconference.com and know that the early bird pricing is effective through January. So check it out. And, and there's a lot of really good information in there to help you make the case about why you need to go. So uh, I encourage you to go in and, and check that out. And because we are at the end of our webinar hour, I just want to thank everyone, uh, thank our sponsor, under um, IBM. Without the support from our solution providers, AIM wouldn't be able to bring you these free educational programs like our webinars. I encourage you to download the resources that are in the slide area. Also, when this webinar is over, a survey is going to um, open up on your desktop, and that's just uh, getting feedback for how we did today. Appreciate it if you take a few moments to answer the questions that are in there. And uh, we have been recording the webinar, and it's going to be available in the next couple of days at AIM.org's resources webinars page. So come back, listen to it again, and invite your colleagues to come and uh, listen to this very helpful presentation. So as we bring the webinar to a close, I want to leave you with our speaker's closing thoughts or key takeaways. So I want to begin first with uh, Stu Leibowitz from IBM, your closing thoughts today. Well, thanks. I, I uh, simply hope that you understand a little bit more about RPA today and uh, more broadly about how um, IBM is helping our customers extend RPA uh, with something that we're calling digital labor. Thank you, Stu. And Chris Serdak of Serdak & Co., your closing thoughts today. I just to echo what Steve just, or Sue just said, and I think it's absolutely critical. Don't think of RPA or robotics as a new technology implementation, because it's really not. It is the incorporation of a new workforce. The workforce happens to be digital. It doesn't have a shore. It doesn't have uh, needs for breaks. It doesn't unionize, at least not yet. But the, the, the issues that you would need to outsource a business process or start using a workforce in a different country, those are the challenges that you'll face. Um, as you roll out RPA. Much less about technology, much more about how do I leverage a different workforce with different characteristics, and that's where you'll get value from it. Thank you, and thank you everyone for your time and attention today. For AIM, this is Teresa Resick, and we'll see you on our next webinar. Have a great afternoon.